If you can't find a way to enjoy the process, you're fucked. I, I went with the swear <laughs> word there for dramatic effect. You're going to have to bleep it out, Jim. We were talking about Jack, good old Jack Dixon. Yeah, Jack Dixon, who everyone knows and loves. And, and everyone knows him. Everyone loves him. And, uh, but we, after, even after a Google, we're not quite sure who he is. Yeah. So if he is a nefarious character of some kind, innocence, right? Innocence has been claimed here. Right. But he here's could the be a nefarious he, character, but it, it would appear it would appear he's either the owner of a bakery or a rugby player. Yeah, probably one or the other. And and nefar- nefarious or not, he did say a wise thing once, which is if you focus on results, you will never get change. If you focus on change, you will get results. And you open chapter two of Finding right. Bagpipe Freedom, kind of applying this to your experience finding out about and first coming into uh, the CrossFit. Maybe you want to tell me a little bit about that? Well, I think we'll just I'll just talk about this quote here briefly. I think it's just sort of a classic quote that definitely reflects mm, probably what true masters are doing in any field, but it definitely seems to be what the masters do in the world of bagpiping, right? Which is... Mm you know, uh, just, just kind of focusing on the process that's going on, uh, and not over focusing on results. And I think the people who do that, uh, tend to bring home the disproportionate amount of the results. You know, um, Mm. I don't, I don't see too many people out there obsessed with, uh, let's say winning the world pipe band championships. Um, that might be sort of like a secondary obsession, but really you're sort of obsessed with what process is going to be required to maximize your odds uh, of achieving mm-hmm. something like that. But yeah, like, um, I think that's basically it. And I think, I think a lot of the mistakes that people make when they are learning the bagpipes is they end up very results focused instead of uh, yeah. focusing on the process uh, that might be able to y- yield them that result. Yeah, that that makes sense. I I know I've fallen into that trap myself, and I think it's interesting that like it it is it's like maybe it works, maybe it can work sometimes to focus on results, you know. But I think it's it's a it's an an attitude or an orientation that is rife with potential for disappointment and discouragement, you know. Whereas if you're focusing mm-hmm. on the process, you just get joy out of doing the process, and the results just come. Um, not not as much a risk of disappointing your own aspirations there so it's maybe a a safer way to keep going as well another way of looking at it is if you can't find a way to enjoy the process you're fucked i i went with the swear (laughs) word there for dramatic effect you're gonna have to bleep it out jim but uh but if you can't figure out a way to enjoy if you can't figure out a way to enjoy the process you're like totally screwed because you're gonna spend a lot of time Mm -hmm. Uh, and sort of the blood, sweat, and tears doing the process. So, like, you better figure out a way to like it. I think that's the that's the reason diets, like all the ones that I try, I think that's the reason they fail. Right? It's like mm. I don't actually, I haven't actually figured out how to like fruits and vegetables yet. And so, mm. you know, uh, until until I do, I I don't think it's going to be, uh, you know, worth my time and energy to, you know, be obsessed about the rock hard abs. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, uh, totally makes sense, yeah. And, and so you give us in Chapter 2 of Finding Bagpipe Freedom here a, um, a formula to use in that process. Um, and it's a pre- pretty simple. It's three elements put together. Constantly vary your material. Singularly focus on, on uh, objective fundamentals. And always operate at your intensity threshold. And I think each of those probably bears some, some discussion. But those three things together give us musical improvement and, just as you're mentioning here, importantly, enjoyment as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, right? I mean, uh, I think that I think I mentioned this when we talked about chapter one. I really feel like the first two chapters of this book, if I were going to change anything about the book, I might go back and change this. Maybe not. Mm. But, uh, you know, we've really fleshed this out since we've written the book. Uh, and we now mm-hmm. have, 
and maybe someday we can do a podcast series on that. But like we now have our 11 commandments of mastery, we call them. Uh, and so these are really just three of the 11. Um, and we talk about some of the other ones in the book, but they're not like nicely, neatly organized. But, uh, but yeah, these, these are definitely important linchpins of um, successful bagpipe learning, I think, for sure. Uh, you want to start with constant variance? Yeah, let's talk about constant variance. What, what does that mean? And particularly, what does it mean for bagpiping? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I think the first thing to point out is, uh, the first thing to point out in chapter two is we talk a little bit about, I got involved in CrossFit and it really helped me with my personal health and fitness, uh, which is pretty cool. But, you know, one of the, you know, I, I think any CrossFitter would recognize these three principles, you know, as being sort of, uh, directly inspired uh, mm. from that, you know. So constant variance is something that you learn in the fitness space, right? If you just do bicep curls every day, uh, you might end up with big biceps, but you know you're not going to be able to like reach over your head to pick something up, uh, and you're you're going to have chicken legs, right? So you you kind of want to constantly vary what's going on um, and mm. do all sorts of different things. Uh, some things will be inside your comfort zone. Some things will be outside your comfort zone. Some things will be new. Some things will be familiar. But you kind of want to constantly vary that all the time in order to develop, uh, you know, a full uh, range of functional movements that you can do. Right? That's the idea in fitness. And then bagpiping is no different. Right? We should probably, you know, we should probably play a couple of different types of channers and try a bunch of different drone reads. And then on the finger work side, we should be playing different tunes as often as we can. Um, mm. We should be playing simplified stuff. We should be monkeying around with, you know, uh, rhythm, maybe even playing a little bit of snare drum, right? You know, uh, vary up your activities. And that is going to point you in a, uh, in a good direction, right? as opposed to just only ever playing your pipes with one drone on playing amazing grace 17 times every practice session. And then, uh, when, once you've done it 17 times, then you're done for the day, right? That that's mm -hmm. going to turn you into the bagpipe equivalent, uh, bagpipe equivalent of bicep curl guy. Right. Mm. And we'll that's have, the, we'll uh, have musical chicken legs, right? Is that the, the concern? <laughs> exactly. Right. I, and most, most pipers do. Sorry. Sorry, but I've been listening out there. Most most of us uh, have musical chicken legs, right? And that's a big yeah. uh, that's a big problem. The pipers who don't have musical chicken legs really stick out, don't they? Right? They're they're mm. versatile. They're fun to listen to. They can get the crowd going. They can integrate with a, a guitar player if they want to. They could write harmonies to a tune if they needed to. Uh, you know what I mean? They can tune themselves yeah. up easily. Uh, maybe to another instrumentalist, right? So, so the pipers without musical chicken legs really stick out. Um, and then there's also like the rabbit hole, which we won't go down, which is like the pipers without musical chicken legs in your band are going to leave at the end of the year because they're not challenged in mm. your band, right? Um, and yeah. then, you know, they're like they're, those are the players we all fight over. <laughs> yeah <laughs> are the yeah. the players without the musical chicken legs so so anyway what do you got for me well i really like the uh nigh unto poetic dare i say it uh phrase that you use when you're talking about constant variance you suggest that if we if one of the big mistakes we make is to pick just a couple of tunes and those are like the tunes that we play for mm -hmm. the entire year you say that is sealing the yeah. coffin of improvement shut that's a good phrase i like that yes yeah, that, that, that did co accidentally come out. Yeah, that did accidentally come out uh, pretty good. Yeah, so that is, first of all, let's all admit it. And you, uh, you're out there, you're listening to this conversation. By the way, condolences. Uh, you're listening <laughs> to this conversation, and, and then you're thinking to yourself like, oh, wait, I only have three or four tunes that I'm working on right, right now. Um, does that or put one, me in this position? Or two. Answer in my, in my case, right? I've yeah. got my one tune right there. <laughs> well, and we'll talk about the intensity, sort of like the intensity balance momentarily, right? But mm -hmm. if if you're um, if you're only playing a comfortable, if you're only focusing on a comfortable number of tunes, and you do this exact same thing every day, guess what? 
Mm. Uh, you might be approaching you might be approaching some kind of polish for that material, oh, sure. but yeah. you're not but you're not getting any better. You're not getting any better at uh, and you're not becoming a better musician by just playing the same thing over and over again. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, it's yeah. just basically not, it. Not, the uh, the the other sort of uh, image that you use to kind of express the idea more is to suggest that like what if what if you had a house in which you had children learning to read and you only had books about cats that was it right yeah like no variation yes. in material whatsoever right yes um, right you so you have like, a small well, number of get... you have a small number of books you have a yeah. small number of books and uh, see that delay we're fighting again with Jim. And yeah, sorry. Know each other. You have a small number of books and they're all about the same topic, right? That's sort of the equivalent of what most pipers are doing, right? Most of us, mm-hmm. most pipers, not all, but most pipers are in a parade band of some kind, right? And the parade band is going to play obviously all marches, you know, or at least 80% marches. Uh, and there's only going to be four sets, maybe five, mm. uh, maybe six if you're in a really aggressive band, right? But even if you had six sets of marches, right, that's still just marches. What about jigs? What about Strasbase? Right. Uh, you know, what about slow airs? What about Peabrock or something like that, right? That, that mixture of stuff, that exposure, you're going to want all of that, right? And mm-hmm. so if you just bring your kids up, if you just have seven, uh, you know, seven books all at a first grade reading level and all about cats, uh, is your kid going to be able to learn to read that way? Uh, and we all know that's not really what it's going to be, right? The ki- kids eventually learn to read from exposure to a v- extremely wide variety of you know different types of writing, different types of reading, books with pictures, books without pictures, somebody reading to them, being read. It, know, it's, uh, it's, it feels then, like then such an apt reading. metaphor. Like, like the... Um the vocabulary that would be encountered within those seven simple books about cats, you know, there'd be a ceiling to the vocabulary very quickly. And like exactly. the, yes. the various like idioms and ways that different authors write, like if, if your kid reads a lot, eventually they don't even need to have to see what the author's name is on the book. There will be ways in which they can identify like, oh, this is so-and-so. And the same thing happens with music. Um, there's like a musical vocabulary that if you only play simple marches, that vocabulary is going to tap out eventually, right? There's a, it, musical idioms uh, and yeah. stuff that you're not gonna you're not gonna be exposed to. It's um, one of so my the, favorite the, analogies. The other the other thing that you can do, Jim, like I want to go down this rabbit hole just a little bit farther. Uh, the other thing that you that you and I can do, right, is you can pick up a book, right. Here's here's like something fun to think about. Is like you and I and probably most of the people listening, you could pick up a book or a novel. Um, and you when you read it, you don't just read the words. Many of us can jump instantly mm. to that higher level of reading when where we are inferring the actual meaning uh, behind the text. Many of us yeah. can do that when we read a book at first glance, right? And then, you know, and then meanwhile, many or several, maybe many, many of the great pipers can do that as well, right? When I, I could take a brand new 2-4 march uh, that I've never seen before and just sight reading it right, can play it far better with far better expression uh, than the vast majority of others because, you know, like, because we've, like, to your point, we've mastered, like, we've mastered and we've seen many times all the different sorts of vocabulary we're going to see in the tune, all the different styles. Mm-hmm. The note selection's not going to be a surprise. The grace note selection's not going to be a surprise. The rhythm's not going to be a surprise. Uh, none of the embellishments are going to be a surprise. So, like, right away from day one, uh, I can play that tune with meaning and with, with my own personal voice and style, right? Which is what we do when we read books. We do it without even really mm. realizing it, right? It's like, yeah. uh, it's like, oh, I see where this book is going. Oh, wow, that's a really interesting thought. It's like, oh, you know, uh, that lady is going to kill her husband. How many times do you mm. read a book and you just know in the first chapter that the lady is going to kill the husband. I mean, you know, you, it happens seven out of ten times. To recognize that for that, <laughs> in that case specifically, yeah. maybe that's just a thing that happens, right? But <laughs> the foreshadowing thing, right? You've encountered it enough times in other books or in other tunes, as it were, right? That like you've mm-hmm. got the formula ingrained into yourself, so you can consume it on the that wider, that kind of higher view right. kind of thing, rather than sounding out each exactly. letter. 
Exactly. So the, nowhere the in the text, nowhere in the text does it say uh, the lady is going to kill the husband. But you mm. can infer that out of it, right? Because of your mm. vast experience, and you start to you start to be able to see things on a heightened level, right? That all comes from constant variance. It's because you've read a thousand books where the woman kills the husband with those similar clues that it's about to happen, right? Mm -hmm. It's because of that and that variance and all the different things that um, you could sense that it's coming. And by the way, if it's not coming and they're going to do a plot twist, you'll be able to sense that too. Uh, It all has to do with your, uh, it all has to do with your experience. And by the way, it doesn't just come from your reading experience. It also comes from your Netflix experience. Uh, mm. and, and all the musicals that your sister, you know, forced you to uh, watch and listen to when you're growing up. And, you know, all those little things. Um, I was the one forcing my sisters to watch musicals when I was a kid. But, yeah, I got, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> now, you ooh, kind of okay. bring this home by suggesting that we can musically what we want to do then for that constant variance is the equivalent of spreading kids books all over the house and maximizing our exposure to a wide and different sort of um, range of materials. And which makes me think like, okay, so maybe I have one tune book on my desk while I'm polishing up a specific tune, but maybe in general, I should have like three tune books on my desk and some sheet music over Mm -hmm. there, like literally spread music everywhere so that I am literally encountering it all the time. Yes. And I I also recommend state sponsored variants. Uh, uh, as well, on a sec, what? In, in in the sense that uh, if you are running a pipe band or if you're in a pipe band, I think that uh. the pipe band itself uh, should be looking at a lot of varied material as part of its week to week operations, uh, mm. because you know, us beginners and intermediates, they they might not have the slightest idea. Uh, you know, how to sight read well, for example. So having music books all over the place isn't going to do them a lot of good, right? Like Mm -hmm. a lot of bands Mm -hmm. are in that position where there's people, either a lot of beginners or just people of a widely divergent skill set, right? So it would be good to mandate, it would be good to mandate some fresh material every week. Um, Not, and and remember, uh, we're not going to learn all this material to a performance ready state. Uh, That's not what I'm saying. Although you will find you will find that some of this might become future repertoire because everybody in the band really likes it or something like that, mm-hmm. or, or, or that it's definitely not going to go in the repertoire because everybody really hates it. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, just looking at fresh stuff, um, even if, like, I, I, I'm just picturing a band practice where the first 15 minutes, you know, people come to band prepared to, you know, just uh, in a lighthearted way jam through the tune of the week. Uh, before they get down to quote unquote business, um, I like even, that. That sounds more like a than fifteen minutes. Fun way to good. do it. I mean, even being able to. Well, you're like, going to have to rot- right because rotate who in the band suggests the tune or something like that. Like who's going to suggest the tune of the week for this week? That kind of thing could be a lot of fun. Yeah, maybe. Although it usually takes. Uh, usually, I think it would probably best be done at, at least by advanced players who would be able to have a good sense. Like, okay. Is this actually going to be uh, workable by everybody? But yeah, mm. it's like, hey guys, just so you know, this is the tune we're playing next week. So, you know, spend some time with it. And at least that way, you know, let's say your band meets, you know, 48 weeks a year. Well, you could have exposure to 48 new tunes throughout the course of the year. And you know, everybody in your band has that exposure. Um, yeah. And, uh, and go forward from there. That would be huge. That's what I mean by state, state sponsored. Uh, uh, variants. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense and sounds really cool too. So that's our very, our constant variance. What about, so that's item number one in the, in the equation. What about singularly mm-hmm. focusing on objective fundamentals? It's a lot of words. What does that mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, a good way of, um, a good way of boiling it down would be to say sort of everything that you do in, during your practice should have a yes or no pass or fail uh, result. Mm. Okay, that's a good indication. That's a good indication that you're uh, focusing on objective things. Okay, which are far superior to attempting to focus on subjective things. So, for example, you know, um, 
did I play the first part without crossing noises? The answer there is either yes or no. There's no in between there. It's either, mm. it's either yes, I played without crossing noises or no, I did not. Versus what we often get in the bagpipe world, which is like, ooh, you want to make sure that your phrases just have a little bit more light and shade and call and answer and make sure things flow a little bit, right? So now I'm practicing those things. And when I get to the end of the part, I ask myself, did I succeed at uh, playing with good light and shade there? Right? And the answer is, is going to be somewhere in the middle of, yes, I'm absolutely sure I did, or no, I'm absolutely sure I did not. It's going to be like, mm-hmm. ooh, um, I don't really know if, uh, was there enough light? Was it too much shade? Like, right. what is light? <laughs> how, do you, how do you apply <laughs> light to sound? And like, ooh, how, like, what is, ooh, shade? Like, yikes. Okay, and then so we get kind of like, you know, that would be, that would be just one cheesy example of uh, subjectivity, right? Yeah. Uh, and so we want to try to avoid that in our practice, and we want to try to find the objective things that we need to learn uh, to do really well. Now, don't get me wrong. The subjective elements of music are, of course, very important, okay? Mm-hmm. But like generally speaking, okay, we're not going to spend a lot of time practicing those, those subjective things. That's a, you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, th- those are things that are going to be able to come out. You're going to be able to exercise. You're going to be able to express yourself, let's say, as a result of doing the objective things extremely well. And we, we lay out in the book, I think in chapter three, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon, uh, we, lear- we, we learn about the 10 objective things that you should be trying to do. Uh, simultaneously as you play. And if you can do those 10 things, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So there is, you you do uh, tap into this idea a couple times in this section too, about this being maybe fundamentally a rejection of the idea of multitasking. Mm -hmm. But you even suggest that we should have a righteous disdain of multitasking. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, and I think in the queue, something we're going to talk about on the podcast shortly is uh, great bagpiping in 100 words. Mm. And one of the things that the most controversial thing in the 100 words well, is the idea that uh, practice sessions should be very short. But they should be, mm. right? Because, uh, and it's because of this. It's because, that, it's because of the idea that multitasking is not a good idea. It's not what you want to do. Um, and what we would rather do is take a really short period of time and be actually laser focused on singular objective things. Yeah, mm. that's, that's the big idea. Gotcha. Absolutely. So in general, I want to be constantly varying my material. When I sit down to practice, I want to have a focus on something objective to be, to be working on and improving on. So then yeah. What, what is an intensity threshold? How do I make it so I'm doing these things at an appropriate level of intensity? And maybe, yeah, maybe um, we bring back again, the exercise metaphor again, because I honestly thought yeah. that your weightlifting metaphor was like very useful in figuring out like, oh, there's an amount that helps, there's an amount that's too much, there's an amount that's not enough. For sure, right? And then, uh, yeah, and the intensity thing, it's like, it's a fascinatingly wide-ranging, totally applicable idea to so many areas of life. Uh, but to use the exercise one, right? If I want to get strong, I have to lift heavy weights. Okay. That's, let, let's just say as basically the bottom line, right? Like if I want to, um, let's go back to the bicep curl example, right? Uh, if I want my biceps to get super strong, I want to lift heavy weights because we all know if I just bicep curl with this pen, uh, I might exercise my bicep a lot by doing so, but am I getting stronger right now? You can't see my video right now, Jim, because we're in low data mode here, but uh, you know, my bicep is not going to get a lot stronger. It might get tired eventually, but it's not going to get a lot mm. stronger. Uh, so I need yeah. to lift heavy weight. But on the other side of that, there's obviously a limit to the heaviness of the weight before my bicep can't even properly function. Uh, and if I go too far over the limit, uh, I could end up really severely injuring my bicep even, right? Like it's dangerous to go too heavy. So the, the correct weight for me to curl with my bicep is somewhere in between the pen and like, you know, let's say, 
uh, 200 pounds. It's somewhere in between there, but what is the right amount of weight to lift? And you know, even if you're not a weightlifter, you can sort of deduce what the right amount of weight to lift would be, right? We want to kind of push the envelope without going so far as to you know, put ourselves at any sort of risk or danger uh, you know, or, or where it lacks utility. So you, so you want the maximum amount of weight uh, that you can sort of safely do. The maximum amount you can do without sacrificing form is a good way of thinking about right. it, right? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and so that basic intensity idea carries over to a whole bunch of other things in the piping world, right? Like how hard should your chanter read be, right? Well, it should be as hard as it can be without sort of being so hard that it sacrifices your ability to do the other things that you need to do really well, um, that you can keep a clear head, right? That you can stay mm-hmm. comfortable. And we talk a lot about we talk a lot about that at the dojo, making sure that you get a chant to read that's the right strength for you. For example, I'm just getting my world's read from last year going, and right now it's like way too hard for me. <laughs> I'm gonna have to figure out mm. <laughs> I'm gonna have to figure out a way to uh, to get in shape here in the next few weeks to just up the ante a little bit with my band read. But uh, but yeah, like right now it's a little bit on the too hard side. Right, so it's hard to focus on the detail work I need to do, but then there's other things too, right? How fast should your tempo be when you practice a tune? Right, it should be as fast as you can play it without sacrificing the good quality of technique that you're going to need, right? Mm. Uh, and that should dictate what tempo you should play at. Um, how long should you practice? We just touched on this, right? But the length of time should be, you know, as long as you can. But it has to be while maintaining that nice, singular, objective focus. How long Mm. should you play your pipes, right? Again, it's like you should play as long as you can. But at a certain point, your pipes are going to have so much residual moisture in them that they're not going to recover well enough to sound good the next day. So there's a limit Mm. there, right? So the the intensity that we want to bring to all aspects of our piping has to be carefully balanced. Um, and then uh, we see a lot of pipers obviously not do enough, but then we see a lot of pipers do way too much. Like they're going mm. way over the intensity threshold with what they're trying to do. And it causes, you know, probably what our equivalent of injury would be, right? It causes bad habits, right? It causes a bagpipe that's so wet all the time that you have to turn to the dark side and install a moisture control system. <laughs> mm. <laughs> gives me the gives me the heebie-jeebies just saying that yeah i'm not a moisture well, control system hater right but but nine times out of ten the reason a person believes they need moisture control systems is simply a result of totally mismanaging how much they play maybe a topic mm. for another podcast yeah well so not 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 to uh beat the metaphor horse uh too too much of course here uh if it's already dead but um you know you you brought up reading earlier in in an earlier section here as well and you, it comes up here too in a way that resonated for me because i have little kids right now and i've often had the experience of opening up a book to read to them in the evenings and realizing they're not quite ready for this one like this material is not sinking in for them right so they're not enjoying the story but then there's, I've also had the experience of reading them books that are boring to them because they're below where these kids are. I've got so many children there at such, <laughs> across such a range. But there's, there is this mm-hmm. perfect spot where like, if you can find the right book for the kid at where, at where they're at, they'll understand what's going on, even though that book will push them a little bit. There'll be some words in there they won't understand, some concepts that are a little bit big, a little bit out there for them. But it's like within... Yeah within reach that they can they can piece it together and that's how they start picking up those new words and getting those new ideas mm-hmm. right um there's a sweet spot right. there there is a total sweet spot isn't there yeah and and a lot of times you you're a lot of times you're not going to know where that sweet spot is as a matter of fact you almost certainly don't right like you have these built-in bias biases biases you have these mm. built-in biases, biases uh okay. that uh biases Biases? I'm not sure. Now I'm not, not sure that. about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, have, uh, you have biases that are built in. No, it doesn't. No, if you rearrange the sentence, it doesn't, doesn't help the problem. Yeah, I was hoping uh, there was But uh, yeah, you have biases <laughs> that are, 
Yeah. The, so you, you hedge, you, you, you naturally will hedge mm. where your actual yeah. abilities are, especially if what you're doing is uncomfortable, which by the way, you know, really serious learning or practice or work, you know, like it is uncomfortable to do. Mm. Um, it's an uncomfortable thing. And, you know, for a kid, I think to soak in reading that is outside of their comfort zone, right? You, you kind of want to be right on the edge of that comfort zone when you're learning new things. To be on the edge of the comfort zone is not comfortable. There's a lot that has to happen, and it requires a lot of focus and a lot of energy. Um, and so, yeah, you know, uh, just fun story. Uh, my daughter and I, we go to Hartford, Connecticut, on a regular basis. It's about a two-hour drive uh, for some medical treatments for her allergies. And uh, so we've been doing all the Harry Potter books, and, like, oh, it yeah. just blows my mind – it just blows my mind how much she is able to understand, mm. you know, like things that took me a while to figure out, like, um, and, and piece together, I, you know, sometimes I'll pause the book and I'll, I'll ask her just sort of like prodding questions to see if she's actually retaining any of like the detail and the subtlety. And she totally is. It's bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a seven and a half year old totally gets it. But like, um, but yeah, like, I mean, when you're stuck in the car and you would otherwise be really bored, it allows you to zero in on that material. Um, mm. and you'll be surprised where the upper limits of your abilities are if you actually, you know, test those in a smart way. You know, mm. uh, one thing for sure about one thing that's for sure true about the Harry Potter stuff is like, that's constantly varied, uh, types of material as well. Right. Like you've got, mm. you've got like some fantasy elements, you've got some moral elements, you've got some like romance elements, and then you've got some like murder mystery elements and it's all kind of mixed together in like a big epic sort of cornucopia style. Uh, and it's, so it's really interesting. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think that's part of the reasons those books have been so successful is because it just hits you with so many uh, so many different angles, all sort of hmm. intertwined into one story. Um, it's no, that cool. makes sense. It's not not just the one genre, and that feels applicable to what we're talking about with music here as well, right? Like if if it were yeah. just one very strict genre, where like the 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 fences were up and it didn't delve into any of the others, it probably wouldn't be as much fun. And if we're if our playing is very narrow we maybe will get bored with our own playing and and maybe not enjoy it so much but if we can try yeah. other stuff we might enjoy it It reminds me it reminds me of that lincoln hilton halloween video i'm not sure if that was his breakout video but it's the first one i noticed of his do you know mm. the one i'm talking about uh Wait, no t well very likely just because i've obsessively consumed everything he's ever produced i'm just trying to think which one it would have been yeah, um, it's got the funny tuning and it's sort of the Halloween style, but it's basically uh, he he basically uh, superimposed the style of I don't really remember some, something by Bach or something like that, right? And he sort of like mm -hmm. superimposed that idea uh, onto the practice chanter with the you know with some clever backing arrangement and everything like that. But it was just mind blowingly cool, and it should be no surprise that it totally went viral. But it's like why? It's because we're uh, it's because we, we're Venn diagramming the two forms of music and we're exploring ways that, you know, that other form of music relates to this one. And it's really fascinating and cool and we haven't heard it before and it really captures our attention and it's all making sense to me. But like, um, I'm not sure what the percentage of pipers are that, you know, contemplate the similarities between, you know, fugues and, uh, you know, typical mm. bagpipe tunes. Um, but, uh, you know, that's where the, that's where the magic is, the mixing and the matching mm. and, you know, uh, or when Stuart Little does a Highland fling while he plays the fling on the pipes, you know, like that's cool. Right. So like you, you've, ex yeah. there's another example of just, you know, real meaningful exposure, uh, to varied material. It's like, not only has he become quite fluent at playing the pipes, but he's also quite fluent at like the uh, adjoining activities. Uh, and mm. that, you know, those Venn, those Venn diagrams, that's where the money is. Right? Not, not literal money, in, but in that's the where, section the, where stuff the crosses enjoyment. over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're only going to get that 
uh, by, uh, you know, exposing yourself to a lot of different influences and points of view. Um, Mm. Mm. you know what I mean? That's what real learning is. Yeah. And then, no, that's, that's beautiful. uh, And then you can sort of spot the themes too. And then you can spot the themes and then it's really fun. Yeah. And I, I, I think it's important to keep that in mind that like the motivation behind this chapter, this section, this book, right? All of this is not just be a better bagpiper so you can win medals, right? It's enjoy playing bagpipes, right? This is to bring more yeah. joy to the experience. Um, you, you kind of yes. round out the chapter with this suggestion that we should replace nonsense with sense. How do you feel like that Uh-oh. is a... Uh, Maybe maybe land us there. What do you what do you think about that? This sounds like this sounds like uh, some place uh, where I could get myself in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's not like that's not something you've done before, right? So at this point, like, go ahead, right? Go ahead and get yourself in trouble. I don't know. Do you have any questions that you can help get me out of the gates on this one? I don't really. Yeah, remember absolutely. What I wrote so you here. you suggest here. Here's the thing that stood out to me is that you often suggest you you suggested that often teachers will rely on successful outliers like students who have mm. unusually high aptitude or just who have a lot of time to practice etc in order to justify yeah. what are really not great um methods for teaching and learning and they'll say look at that so and so their proof that person is proof that this method works so why are you trying to change it where it's like yeah but look at 99 other so and so's for whom this just isn't working right Exactly. Uh, yeah. And then I'm, I'm not sure that's, I think that might've just been a comment that, um, fit in well in that section. I'm not sure that's exactly what mm. that section is exactly about, but Oh boy, it's so true. Isn't it? Yeah. We, we, uh, mm. we point to the outliers and then we say, see, I told you that's all you have to do. And it's like, no, wait, like that person is a freak. No, no offense. And, and not in a bad way, but no, that person is Good just kind a of freak. freak. Yeah. What about the 99% of the other people that are not freaks for which your method has totally failed? Right. Mm-hmm. Like that's what I've seen. That's what I've seen. You know, like, so I guess I've been the freak, I suppose, you know, uh, coming mm-hmm. up, like I was just the kid, I was just the kid who had it. Uh, and that, you know, the rest was kind of history and, you know, uh, I think generally speaking, in, instructors were super stoked to like, you know, help me out and teach me, teach me more. And so for me, my trajectory was, you know, I wouldn't say it was easy, but it was like, it was well set. Like, w- like mm. the piping world knows what to do with the 1% freak shows, uh, for lack mm. of a better term, right? It knows what to do, but what about the other 99%? And then, uh, mm-hmm. you know, when you look at that population of people, uh, it's mind blowingly inadequate what goes on. That's just my opinion. Like, feel free to disagree with me. Uh, you know, uh, no problem at all. Maybe someday we could have a fun debate about that. But yeah, to me, like that is something that's uh, a glaring problem with the piping world. Mm-hmm. But it also presents an, a huge opportunity. And you know, we've really our business has really angled itself towards that population. You know, like let's get down to brass tacks here exactly what are we trying to do, you know, for, for those of us who can't just like instantly pick up, uh, new concepts just by osmosis for lack of a correct scientific term. I think it's actually technically diffusion. Oh, interesting. Diffusion versus osmosis, huh? Well, the the thing that you, I could have, I could have tied this to like what you, where that comes out in the chapter is, is basically looking back at what we've gone through already You suggest that um, in the bagpiping world, we often seem to apply this weird strategy where it's like an anti-scientific dogmatic approach where it's like Mm -hmm. um, we're going to rely on tired, unvaried material, subjective, erratic focus areas, and dangerously high intensity in order to learn to play bagpipes. It's like the opposite of the three things we just went through, right? And then then relying on those things... Mm. I was just going to say, if you did that in the gym, you'd be like, uh, you'd be paralyzed below the legs, you know, by the end of two weeks. Right. And, and doesn't <laughs> that anyway, happen to a yeah. lot of people musically when they try to learn to play bagpipes, they in a way get bagpipe paralyzed and they don't progress beyond mm-hmm. the first couple of weeks on the practice chanter. And maybe part of that is because of we've been using nonsense instead of sense in order to yes. teach bagpipes. 
I think there's going to be an attrition rate with anything, but uh, we've discussed mm-hmm. this before, Jim. The attrition rate when you're trying to t- teach someone how to play bagpipes is embarrassingly high. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like if you teach ten yeah. people, if you start teaching ten people how to play bagpipes, maybe one ever touches the bagpipes. Maybe one. Yeah. You know, like that's bad. Like I maybe like let's get it to like. And I think it's a it's a largely to do with all the radical nonsense that goes on, you know. Uh, one of which is like, oh, you have to play embellishments at least as good as this like absolute master over here before we'll even allow you to touch a bagpipe. It's like, ugh, dear lord, yeah. it doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> uh, it doesn't make any sense at all. I think we could get. And by the way, we've seen it. We be, we do it. People around us do it. The people that implement the dojo materials do it. I mean, we see that attrition rate way lower, way, way, way lower. Mm. If you just teach people in a way that's a little bit more commonsensical. It's not to say that no one else does it either. That's not what I'm, what I'm going at here. But in order to do it, you have to wade through a lot of the nonsense and you have to find your own way that, um, that makes sense and that comes into line with a lot of these sort of universal things that we know about learning. Mm. Mm. I feel I, like, that I feel like that's, a, that's a an episode, yeah. Stop. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll play the whole pause out. <laughs> Fade us on the pause. <laughs> yeah, just... All right, I think that'll be a solid episode. Two men, two men sitting, admiring their work. <laughs>